when I'm fascinated by something, I feel this kind of bubbling warm energy. It's kind of rising upwards my spine and then spilling into my uh, limbs and my head and it kind of just moves me like a magnet towards things and it's an energizing instinct kind of uh, I notice when there's no juice for the <laughs> sexual instinct I kind of go into the very kind of catatonic state and then the sloth really kicks in. Welcome to another episode of What It's Like to Be You. I'm Josh Lamine, your host. Today I'm speaking to a sexual nine, sexual social nine wing eight named Kaize Yalvianen. We cover a lot of ground in this conversation. We talk about what it's like for Kaize to be a core nine with uh, a flatline tri-type, nine, uh, the 935 trifix and also a triple reactive overlay and <clears throat> it's just very interesting to me how kaiza as you'll experience in this conversation has a very even slow demeanor and the stories that she shares and the kinds of things that go on in her inner world are actually quite stormy you might say or at the very least peak in terms of their emotional and psychological intensity in a way that really doesn't get through the layer of presentation. We also explore a lot about what it means to be a sexual dominant nine and what it means to self-regulate through the sexual instinct, what it means for her as a nine to be seeking essential harmony through the sexual instinct. And there's really a way that this conversation helps me understand the texture of the sexual instinct from a sexual dominant point of view. And there's a really beautiful couple of moments towards the end where we're exploring what it really means to not compartmentalize the sexual aspect of your experience out of your life like sexual blinds do, but actually have it to be for forefront in your experience in the way that she has it for her. One final thing to note about Kaiza is that she is a graduate student in psychology and I think given that plus her five fix, she is able to speak to her own inner world with remarkable clarity. And as I'm sure you know by now, having watched some of these interviews, I think of it as a great privilege to speak with people who've cultivated a sense of their own interiority with a degree of precision that allows them to articulate it. And um, this conversation was extremely rich from that point of view. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. Please welcome Kaiza. Welcome everyone to another interview. I am so excited to be with my new friends, Kaiza Yavianen, who is from Finland and studying psychology currently in a gap year and with her studies. And I would love for you to just introduce yourself actually with respect to your typing, um, your whole typing. And let's, let's begin there. Okay. Hi everyone. So I was typed one year ago as nine wing eight my instinctual stacking is uh, sexual social my trifix is nine three five uh, the flat line and my overlay is eight four six which is like uh, funny because it's highly contrasting to my uh, trifix because my overlay it's triple reactive while the trifix is the flat line. So there's kind of the minimal expression versus the very reactive expression. So it was actually really hard to type myself. I thought I was three wing four for a very long time. <laughs> it's my second fix, so yeah, but I think when I received the result, the nine wing eight landed really well. It's kind of, I had maybe some idea that I could have that uh, in my trifix or I could even have that core. So it, it wasn't, uh, I, I had a very easy time like getting into observing the type in my daily life. And mm -hmm. <laughs> hearing the many 
other types, except, uh, especially like Hexat. I think nine and eight is uh, quite an easy one <laughs> once you get a grasp of what's going on. So when we first met um, for our initial kind of pre-interview chat, I was I was really impressed with how much and how deeply you've thought about um, not just the Enneagram, but your own typing structure and the way that it all works in you. And the way that you just set it up now is it's like you experience some pretty extreme polarities internally. You have the um, very withdrawn flatline kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you have the triple reactive overlay. Um, you also are another polarity that we talked about is you being a core nine, which is um, as you're experiencing it has a lot of withdrawn energy, but also sexual dominant, which has a need to broadcast yourself. In yeah, a certain and sense. the eight wing. And, so, like, and the eight wing, yeah. The eight wing is kind of giving the kick that, to that nine core. It's like, hmm. uh, as it says in the Enneagram website, nine, the eight wing gives the nine a permission to be as nine as it wants. So like, uh, what that means <laughs> that like, sexual nineness is just, the eight wing kind of gives me a permission to do it whenever However, it's there's not a lot of consideration into how it how it's gonna kind of come across. It's like as it said, it's nine nine wing eight is a bit sloppy that way. Mm -hmm. But the flatline, like I think my biggest influences are uh, flatline and attachment. I, I mean withdrawn and attachment. But I get really outgoing often and the triple reactive kind of has this kind of immediacy around it uh it's kind of like my attention is really caught by something and the reactivity is like it's like a thorn in my flesh it's in a way that like kind of like i need to address this thing like right now and why is why is everyone not addressing it but then on the other hand the uh, withdrawn and flatline it's just I'm just like uh, I might internally feel the reactivity but it's not necessarily necessarily shown outwards at all it's just like my normal face is neutral and uh, the overlay is kind of negative but the thing is that especially in a social setting neutral is already kind of <laughs> negative ish so i have a lot of people often asking me like what's wrong and you look so angry or you look so sad and i'm like this is my normal face and i'm a nine it, it really takes a lot of energy if i'm just gonna like smile for no reason mm -hmm. like head types are very bright in the head and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm head last so <laughs> my head is slow and it takes some energy to kind of start beaming in the head mm -hmm. one thing that is interesting to me about what you're saying is you experience internally that thorn in your flesh of the triple reactive thing my experience of you and your energy is as far away from triple reactive as it possibly could get. It's like, mm -hmm. you you know, you seem like um, just placid and oceanic, to use your word that you were using before. Um, it's like, there's a lot of stillness in your body and also in your just energetic presence. And or at least the way that you're affecting me, like even right now in this moment. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of, it's funny. It's hard for, it's hard for me to ex like even think of you as having a triple reactive component, but I get that it's, it stirs some kind of inner storm. Um, yeah, that you experience. I, yeah, exactly. Like that's the thing with nines because they are kind of, uh, suppressing the rage and everything mm -hmm. that their internal experience is vastly different from how it comes across. Mm -hmm. I think. That, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Can we talk about. I would love to set this up just with 
your experience of nineness it, at, itself to the extent that it's possible not that, this is um sort of an intellectual exercise because it's mm. i'm trying to isolate your inner experience of nineness from the rest of your stru typing structure which is actually not a possible thing but um, it is not uh <clears throat> I, i'm not sure if it's possible yeah but like just just in terms of the some of the core facets of nine like sloth or um the way you experience energy itself or your life force or suppression of things or what what vitalizes yeah. you that kind of that kind of stuff oh yeah i can go into that but uh, i would have to include my dominant instinct that's great yeah let's go there mm -hmm. mm. well i'm sexual dominant and mm -hmm. uh, they are actually the lowest two centers like kerchief plays the centers like along the spine and Mm -hmm. uh, so on. So the gut center and uh, the antisexual center, they are like the lowest. So when mm -hmm. I'm when I feel energetic and vitalized and kind of getting into the sexual instinct more, when I'm fascinated by something, I feel this kind of bubbling warm energy. It's kind of rising upwards my spine and then uh, spilling into my uh limbs and my head and it kind of just moves me like a magnet towards things and it's an uh, energizing instinct kind of uh i notice when there's no juice for the <laughs> sexual instinct i kind of go into the very kind of catatonic state and then the sloth really kicks in. I think my bodily functions, they just shut down and I will go into the energy saving mode. And how you described it, it's like a global shutdown to the body. But when I uh, get hooked by something, then it's just I get a really like big amount of energy it's like either zero or hundred there's no in between so hmm. yeah what do you can you give me an example of something you get hooked by well uh it's often people mm -hmm. topics of conversation like especially uh topics that kind of uh, get into the bottom of explaining the whole existence or psychology or the universe or any kind of like obscure topic it's well that's very like five flavored but then uh, also like hmm, interesting people everything that's some somehow vibrant and beautiful and out of the norm and kind of how would I explain well that's an easy example about when there is no juice which would be like most of the environment unfortunately mm -hmm. this kind of professionalism and institutionalizing culture is like it's so uh -huh. dry uh -huh. I re like I remember at school, I really tried to pay attention, but my body was like shutting down. I got the sloth, sloth <laughs> going on. My eyes always started like, you know, when someone is about to lose consciousness, the eyes just like start rolling upwards mm -hmm. and I tried to keep myself awake. And I had like various sharp items and I just under the desk, I, I kept stabbing myself just to stay awake. Wow. Uh, and every time I tried to study or something, I just fell asleep. And it's actually, <laughs> um, when, you know, when people say in the group something that is self self-respondents are like spoiled brats or something 
it's not that we think that we are better that some 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 kind of mundane things or could be that too but it's mostly because like we we are not able to do it like we are physically not able to we are gonna pass out <laughs> or at least i'm going to uh-huh. and, uh, like i can i can listen to stuff where is where there is no juice but i'm gonna have to stab myself to do it and um i will eventually like i would burn out i've had such a severe burnout uh, in my life how are you experiencing like I i'm really struck by the severity of what you're saying oh like, yeah you better get used to it because i'm gonna <laughs> throw curveballs i should add a disclaimer to the <laughs> episode probably <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the curveballs are. Uh, there is juice. <laughs> they're delivered. I mean, they're verbal and conceptual, and I get. And you're talking about your experience, but the curveballs are happening at um, an energetic level that's no different from when you're not throwing a curveball. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or like, yeah, you're yeah. Um, are you but, referring to my uh, expression? Of yes, or? I'm. Ex I'm referring to your energy which is based well flat line is a word for it but it's yeah. like it's the same even when you're t when you're, you're talking about stabbing yourself let's just be clear when you're a child right in school um taking a sharp object from under your desk to to stay awake or stay engaged and to basically like keep yourself in some kind of way conscious yeah um because there was so because as i understand it you were so bored or on it was like there was no possibility of being hooked by anything that was in your environment, yeah. you know? Well, yeah, it's, it's bored, but also uh, the instinctual drives are kind of regulating our states of arousal and states of being awake mm -hmm. or like states of wakeness. Yeah. That's a good and, way to put it. Uh, yeah. And mm -hmm. when, uh, when they kind of, how would I say it? When there is a, I forgot every word in the world. One moment. <laughs> yeah. Take your time. Yeah. Um, when the situation doesn't have any uh, needs that could be could be met for the core instinct. I think, especially with nines who have uh, sloth the, and withdrawn, the mechanism is to shut down and go into a cocoon or, you know, when seeds or fungi, if they go through a dry period, they are just going into this uh, stage of stasis. They could spend years in that state and then wake up when there is water, I think. That's what my instinct is doing. Maybe assertive types could like create that uh, choose there or something, but um, mm. I have a bigger withdrawn in influence. So mine was to kind of withdraw in my head, in my own conceptual things and I just couldn't give myself awake. I was I was really fighting hard, hard, falling asleep. But it it just always happened. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm getting a a really strong hit from you of head last energy, and it's it's not like anything that you're saying specifically. It really is an energy. Because what you're yeah. saying is what you're saying has a lot of intellectual heft and clarity as I'm experiencing it. But um, it's just my experience of you in this moment, you know, if you're listening to this as a podcast, you're not going to see this, but like just the way you are being, it's like I can feel that you're a body type. Um, and it's almost like to um, to take your internal body experience and then verbalize it 
in a mental way, there's, it's almost like there's, there's some actual process you have to go through to, to, to name your experience and then get it out. So I can feel like in a sense, the distance or the, the engine that's, that's having to do that. Like if I were talking to a seven, the, ver the words would be like much more, well, quick and facile and metaphors pinging and stuff like that. And yeah, they're kind um, of processing as they go, but yeah, yeah. You have to kind of, mm, well, first of all, what is my internal experience? That is already a mystery because I have all the uh, kind of objectifying and a lot of this dissociating influence. So what is even my internal experience? I have to find it and then I have to translate it. And that takes some time and it's, yeah, I have been kind of cultivating a very uh, broad vocabulary and verbal capability, but it's not coming out very fast and it has some limitations and it can get like overly technical uh, uh, instead of being like that I would actually express my experience. I see. Yeah. Um, how are you feeling right this moment? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> how, how do I know that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <clears throat> I don't like sitting for a long period of time. Uh -huh. mm, um, I really don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't know how I, how I feel. I should probably try and connect with my heart space. I kind of forget to do that a lot of times. Um, Why are you asking? Because. I had an intuition that it would be a good idea. <laughs> um, we're, we're, this is funny. We're two head last people speaking to each other. I, I have this, <laughs> yeah. I had this energetic sense that um, <clears throat> our conversation was drifting into um, to like your inner experience of yourself and my inner experience of myself. And mm -hmm. um, I had the thought that, asking you how you're feeling right now would kind of bring us back into a, an, a we space instead of two eyes. I see. Well, words are certainly quite clumsy, <laughs> but how is your internal experience? What are you feeling? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty calm, settled. Mm. Um, I'm feeling curious about your experience. I'm feeling <laughs> um, one thing I notice is that um, when I speak with when I've when I've done these interviews with other typing sort of with other people that are let's see maybe head types or just, I don't know, people of other typing structures. There's, there's usually like clear, clearer demarcations in the conversation of like, we're not exploring this topic and then we're gonna explore this topic. Or mm -hmm. I have a better sense of being able to direct the conversation into those kinds of areas. And in this conversation, I have, um, I don't have that. <laughs> I have a sense of, I have a sense of being in a somewhat, murky state of exploration of the totality of your inner experience all at once yeah <laughs> um <laughs> yeah because head types, they are like throwing yeah. like throwing a ball like there yeah. are turns they are like tennis turns. yeah it's like playing tennis i don't have that like and the five fix is not gonna help with that because it's like I, either i'm I, five fix is not very like 
socially attuned with with the other person so I kind of have to manually try to manage that when I speak but it was very interesting my I have two sisters both of them are sevens Mm -hmm. and what I learned in the AA Dark Arts Academy is that head types they can like process what they hear at the same time that they speak and like when they are speaking on on top of you they are still kind of taking in what you say and it's like still already going out and i don't have that and i feel i feel so slow and when i try to be quick like them i just end up consuming so much energy and uh, then i have to withdraw for a week (laughs) I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an assertive type, so maybe it's a little different for me, but um, as a person who, I mean, I have uh, nine as my secondary fix. Yeah. Um, that and sense have, of yeah. having, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I have an assertive second fix and assertive wing, but still, <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's like that. Unless yeah. it's, it's a conversation that ultimately what kind of energize me because i think what the uh sexual instinct especially is doing is that uh it's kind of volatile it adds a lot of energy into the thing that you are magnetized by and you all of your focus goes there and i have experienced several times that when I'm really into something, be it a person or a, a topic, that I just can't sleep. I end up <laughs> skipping night sleep because I just can't. I'm like so into the thing. So I think one mm-hmm. um oh, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> well, I find that interesting. I find that quite amazing, actually, that like the experience of being pulled really strongly by an interest or like it's almost like my sense of you is that it's very difficult for you to rev your own engine. And um, but you exist in this state of profound open receptivity like waiting, hoping that something will start the engine. And when the engine starts, it's like your entire being, life force, every fiber aligns to that thing and it becomes very focused on that thing. And it's it's actually difficult to turn the engine off um, until maybe you reach a point of exhaustion or something like that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I couldn't have found a better way to put words into it that was like uh, perfectly articulated (laughs) 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 while as energies I think I think someone wrote a comment in the group that uh, self-press is like a low hum low steady hum and uh, social maybe is a bit like polka dotted but sexual then is this kind of zero or hundred changing according to the uh, circumstance and the target and when it gets on there's like a tunnel vision and I don't know how this is for other core types but gut type inherently it's a moving uh, center it's like a moving center and so when I get magnetized by something then I'm already going Like, my head doesn't have a lot to say about that. The only thing my head does is that, because it's a competence type, it's like, well, we can make it happen like this and this and this and that way. It's not like, even, there's no question if I should do it or not. I'm just, I'm just going. (laughs) Can you talk about being a sexual type and being, and having double competence in your fic, in your uh, typing? Uh, Oh, yeah. Um... I can kind of, 
I'm just going through like so many tangents right now, but uh, I can somewhat like circulate or triangulate around the blind spot. Okay. Because I, I have a hard time like getting what self press even is. So I think inherently every instinct is trying to get resources. Like self press is associated with resources, but I think every instinct is because uh, I'm kind of collecting resources for attraction and resources for chemistry and what social is doing is collecting social resources and how to get the sexual uh, resources that's what the competency fixes have helped a lot I kind of I have optimized my nutrition intake it's according to my monthly cycle and there are like four phases and in every phase there's a really different and separate kind of need for nutrition i have optimized everything and i know i know them by molecular structure because if it's one of my interests it's one of my fascinations and the instinct is the driving force so the fixes are kind of harnessed towards the goal of the instinct so my competence is applied in the sexual context that is that is fascinating and mm -hmm. can do you have words for why your nutrition plan is directed via sexual instinct versus self-preservation instinct like why that's on its face it would be like oh nutrition that's self -pres. Oh yeah. Well, that is self-press, but there's nuance in the kind of nutrition I eat. For example, I eat mostly vegetarian. I need my body to kind of, well, first of all, weird to be self-press blind, but be a gut type and have competency type. Competency types is kind of... Uh, compensating for the self press blind but uh, the nutrition makes me I don't eat anything that would hinder my reproductive health I don't eat anything that would uh, make me smell bad or anything I eat only foods that make very kind of healthy glowing clear skin and hair and because as a nine it's very important to uh, regulate the nutrition to be optimal. Otherwise, I will have a loss of energy if I, yeah. So I want to kind of be sure to have this kind of um, inherent attractiveness about the food and I think maybe some of it could even be that that kind of social contextualizing with sexual social that I'm the kind of person who eats this healthy food and stuff but honestly I can't stand processed food I think I get I get like heart palpitations and it um, it kind of feels bad in my body it makes mm -hmm. me really tired mm -hmm. and it it makes me really smelly i don't like that i'm sensitive to like <laughs> pheromones this the smell thing is really interesting i mean that f has the feeling of sexual instinct to me like just being aware i mean i guess you could be self-pressed too but it, the feeling of like <laughs> how i am smelling is <laughs> so as a sexual blind person that's like I, I very rarely think about that really it's like yes um I think that's I mean, one of the yeah. first things like I notice about a person is that what is their kind of natural scent or it can't be uh, thoroughly uh, kind of masked with with uh, artificial scents. It's always coming through. And that's like, I'm very aware of that. And so, you know, 
people can smell the uh, good genetic match if their genetics are like right. optimal for reproduction. Uh, I think sexual types are very aware of that because some people's smell is just so intoxicating. Mm -hmm. That feels also um, extra heightened because of you being a body type. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. And then there's uh, <laughs> another thing with the competency is that um, at first I was a serial monogamist, but they were like destructive in their outcomes. So I decided that I have to adapt to the uh, culture that is currently going on with the dating world, which is like kind of disposable and having one night stands. And I had, um, well, I started my kind of sexual life quite late uh, come Comparing to other people, I think. Mm -hmm. And after a couple of relationships, I, I really had to get into the bottom of well, how, how do I move in the dating culture? Because I can't just jump into a relationship. I have to be able to have other type of relations. So <laughs> I applied my competency. I had three dates on three days they were like uh, um, they were what is the word again well one was in friday the next was saturday then sunday consecutive yeah yeah, yeah i guess yeah. <laughs> yeah. sure okay so, so uh, i had sex with each of them mm -hmm. But the main idea was to collect data to <laughs> kind of make an assessment about what, what is a one night stand, how, how does it work? <laughs> and like, <laughs> what is the main, wow. main idea of having, uh -huh. having a one night stand? And I think like uh, three occasions is enough to have a sufficient <laughs> amount of data. So yeah, I think I learned a lot. It wasn't necessarily an experience that I was really, well, I didn't get very high on it in the sense of the sexual instinct. It wasn't uh -huh. very mind blowing, but I think it was important information and it, it kind of had an effect to me that I gained some confidence that, okay, I know what's going on and I think I can go, go through this, through this. So then I was ready for Tinder and that sort of stuff so <laughs> that is so interesting yeah there's a there's a few things about that i mean there's just i'm curious about the insights it, that you got just on their on their own but one of the observations i'd like to make is that you as a nine with an eight wing particularly sexual dominant nine with an eight wing my experience of your energy is like kind of like caramel it's like there's just this kind of oozing like thing. And even though your double competence in your trifix mm. and the way you're describing this is kind of dry. Like I had three dates on three consecutive days and I had sex with each and this is the insights I got and this is how I kind of went about it. Um, yeah. That's all, that's packaged in a nine wing eight sexual envelope <laughs> that has a certain kind of like Mm, kind of quality and I can't I don't know what there's no there's not a word for it it's just a feeling yeah. and it it surprises me it's a, it surprises me that that was you went about this in such a strategic way mm -hmm. given that your core type is 918 um, exactly it's been a kind of weird to realize that uh, being self blind doesn't mean that you are inherently bad at everything it's just that whatever skills you have you apply it to the sexual instinct uh, i could have like very intricate plans and everything it's just that i apply it to the sexual instinct and completely ignore the selfers i actually have another story too i would have many but 
for specific reasons, I think I should tell also this one. Um, well, I start at the beginning because there was a beginning thing, which is okay. Okay, my friend uh, was assaulted in a sexual situation, so I got into the into the line to six. Uh, there when the per perpetrators started to kind of threaten her they start he started to threaten me and uh, I felt responsible because I had introduced them so I went on the line to six you know like not over my watch and <laughs> over my dead body you know this kind of protective <laughs> I wanted to uh, go there and be an immovable shield so, mm -hmm. uh, and it was like, there was a lot of stuff going on and we took it to the police and it kind of stayed in the, there was no closure and I had this kind of huge reactive energy and a lot of energy there uh, in my body. And a lot of times when I get this kind of energy, it, is, it feels like it's so much that I can't contain it. I have to find outlets where I can uh release it because it's gonna it's gonna release itself in some way i just have to kind of manage the way so okay so i had this kind of huge energy so <clears throat> i then <laughs> went into a date um the guy was a soldier and for legal reasons let's say that <laughs> This is a hypothetical situation. I hypothetically infiltrated a military building with high security and stuff. I uh, kind of hypothetically had a uniform and everything. So that was like real kind of <laughs> James Bond shit going on. And all that sense of danger kind of I had to get into the sense of danger in my body I have to get attuned to it and that was the perfect situation I really got in touch with the danger and the everything and um, that all of that added to the erotic tension I kind of transmuted yeah. it into an erotic energy energy and I mean, okay, someone might judge me about that, but like, if you are agreeing with certain power structures that use violence and exploitation and everything, um, I, I, I don't think I did anything wrong with that because I'm not really buying into those structures. They shouldn't exist. So... That was like my nine make love not war protest, and you know supported by a five fix right there. Yeah, it's yeah. This shouldn't yeah. exist, so I'm not going to play by the rules. Yeah, and they don't apply to me. Yeah, exactly. And because the A wing is kind of giving me permission to be as nine as I want, and like my I'm American Psycho adjacent, like three, five, eight. So it was mm -hmm. this kind of nine, sexual nine thing, uh, but it was performed in the manner of American Psycho and triple reactive overlay. <laughs> so, that is, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. Just one point of clarity. So, you, so this thing happened to your friend, and you and you had this energy that you were trying to um, release or channel or diffuse in some kind of way. Yeah. And this was, was this a, this is the way that you consciously chose to channel it or you're saying that yeah. because the situation arose, it, it, it happened to be a release valve for you. I, I guess m my question is in the direction of your intention. Well, that's a very good question because I was consciously aware that this might not be a good idea, but I was also consciously aware that I have to release the energy and... I was kind of 
consciously aware of choosing that thing. But I don't know. I have this kind of scientist thing going on that I'm like, I wonder what would happen if I did this. <laughs> I wonder what would happen if I like poked it here a bit. Mm-hmm. So mm, I'm kind of experiencing things as if I'm not there, sort of. But still, I think I chose it because I kind of need it. That is the kind of thing that I, I like to do. And also, I didn't sleep that night at all. And I just, next day, I just arrived to work as if nothing had happened. <laughs> because person. it gave you energy. Yeah, uh, it, it transmuted the energy. Yeah. 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 Like, I, I kind of used the reactive energy and I, I transmuted it and then I gained a lot of uh, energy because it was fascinating and mag- magnetic and it was an interesting adventure mm-hmm. so, yeah <laughs> this story first of all the story is amazing um and also <laughs> I'm really uh, tuning into this like the story is kind of existing at the level of energy and I'll say what I mean by that it's like <laughs> Um, and I'll do this by way of analogy. So if I ever have some kind of buildup of energy in my system, like um, I get stressed about something or I, um, let's, just, let's just say it's like generic work stress or something like that. My release valve as a social type is to talk about it with my friends. Yeah. And... Um, and one of the things that's really striking to me about your story is that you're, so you had this experience with your friend where you had this incredible buildup of energy and there was no way, there was no place for you to put it. Yeah, because and, the, the, yeah. Artists, the threats are, they are very abstract. Um, yes, yeah. Yeah, and the natural yeah. cycle of uh, getting into a threatening situation is immediate kind of bodily release. Yeah. And then you- go but that's often not possible so you kind of have to find ways to um, yeah really... and the release had to be through the sexual instinct for you as a sexual dominant type in other words it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have worked if it was a self pres or social re- kind of release you know what I'm saying uh, it could have uh, I guess but well, I, uh, I do a lot of self-pressed stuff uh, like yoga and wall climbing and kung fu and that kind of thing. But the sexual one is the best way. Yeah, <laughs> and the best by best, I mean... It's just what... that I don't think it's it's best in the moral point of view. It's the way that works for my nervous system. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's like it's it's the most effective way for your nervous system. Yeah, it's like I don't always even agree uh, how my nervous system works. I don't think it's it's a good thing that it works that way. I don't think it's necessarily always moral, but because it works that way, I have to uh, make compromises. Hmm. And sometimes I. I very often I I can do self press stuff if I kind of negotiate with the sexual and find overlaps like where is the sexual instinct overlapping with the self press for example yoga you get flexibility good for sexual for obvious reasons <laughs> and uh, still doing the self press or if if I go study to the library, I'm, I'm like, the sexual instinct is like a teenager that doesn't want to do the thing that it needs to. And I'm like, you can go to the library and go see if there's interesting people. And you can also display your new glasses. You, you look really good with glasses. <laughs> like, oh, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah. This is, I, um, I love this whole part of the conversation. It's part. It's it's reminding me a lot of of John's book. That first of all, the instincts are all about how we regulate ourselves, what we allow mm-hmm. ourselves, what, what we allow 
in a sense, to yeah. regular nervous systems. And so the sexual instinct is profoundly regula regulative for you. Yeah, and it's... the other thing is how the dominant instinct, we kind of do the work of our blind spot instinct through the lens of our dominant instinct. So the dominant mm -hmm. instinct tries to support the, the blind spot instinct in ways that are sort of indirect. And so like you're, you're hitting your self pres need, like you go to yoga, but it's not because like you're trying to feel excellent in your body. It's like there's a sexual kind of motivation to get you to go sexual yeah. instinct motivation. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, it's really hard to get into my body because, uh, it's kind of not a part of my self concept in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And always when people were talking about out of body, out of body experiences, I didn't quite get to what they meant. I was more like, like you have an in body experience, like really. And some time ago I was getting into the practice and doing self press. I was doing like Tai Chi and Qigong and that kind of stuff. I was doing that whole day. And then I got the experience of like being in the body, like, you know, when a baby at some point has the realization that, hey, like these are my hands and I can move them and I'm, I'm, they are my hands that I'm in the hands. So, and that yeah. happened to me some time ago. And I was like, I'm kind of feeling the uh, vital energy of my body. That's not just tied to the uh, sexual energy. It's like my body energy and it's there and it's vibrant and it's, I want to express itself through the body. And that was really amazing. How, how long ago was that? How long ago? Yeah. Uh, month. <laughs> month. Um, yeah. That's, am that's amazing. So that's like a really fresh experience for you. I mean, is that um, is that a turning point in your life in some? Is it a big deal for you, like to have had that experience, or is it like that was a nice thing that happened? Um, kind of a big deal, I would say, and the thing is i don't really remember that i kind of remember the feeling but i can't uh, awaken it as a as an experience if i wanted to i think it would require some a practice of hours and probably some mind altering substances or something like that one of the one of the reasons i asked that question was cuz as so my sense of what it's like to be a nine is that you're a body type, but um, it's the it's the t it's the body type that's least in touch with or has the most difficulty mm -hmm. getting in touch with the actual vi vital experience of being in my body. Yeah. And and that experience of like, oh my god, these are my hands. I'm inside my hands, and there's this vibrance to that experience. Mm -hmm. That's aliveness itself. That's what it's like to be in your body. That's what it's like that's the salient most precious thing and i think exactly. for body types right yeah and um yeah it's also also getting into the gut center like being in touch yes. with the gut center and right. also being in touch with the self breast thing which is like double hard <laughs> for me so but uh about the self breast blind <sighs> that's uh, also another thing it's I have gone years without noticing that I have something wrong or if I'm like sick or if I'm not in a good, good health. And I've had a lot of like abusive relationships because one part of self press is having boundaries and ha having sense of well-being and sustainability. And I didn't have any experience or concept of those. So they got really ignored. And I, at some point, it got so bad that I got these autoimmune diseases like fibromyalgia, IBS, and I started randomly throwing up for no reason. I was feeling so bad mentally, wow. and physically that I started throwing up, and still I had no idea what's going on. But of course, it's gotten easier nowadays. But it's not just that, oh, I forgot to eat once. Hey, 
it's really like things that you could they are like really severe things for example one time i broke my wrist when we were skiing but i forgot about it i i think that i fell and then i said like i think i broke something but i just forgot about it because i had uh wow. i had my crush there and like uh -huh. there you go i don't have a good enough focus to the surface because if there's some sexual thing that's all i'm gonna notice mm -hmm. and it's my friend uh kind of told me in the evening that your hand looks like a potato that maybe you should go to the doctor like can you move it and i was like oh i can't and it, it was just hanging in there i didn't notice but i got oh, it in the package. Yeah. yeah but afterwards of course and i went to the after ski party and next day i was skiing again like there's this mm -hmm. kind of when David has, has associated it to the uh, Bhava Chakra God Realm, mm -hmm. there's kind of... We are not kind of recognizing that there is an immortality in, in our body. It's like we are behaving like as gods, you know, just drinking and doing stuff like, oh, nothing can hurt me and, you know, that sort of thing. Oh, I love that way you just said that, yeah. Um, you're so just so I really get it. Your hand was swollen like potato. Yeah, you, it was. You weren't. Broken. My bones it were was broken. broken. Bones broken. <laughs> and you forgot about it. You didn't. You you. It was not even in your awareness that that was happening. And where was your attention instead? <laughs> on your crush. On the on the crush. On the crush. And yeah. can you can you describe a little more like the quality of that attention and. Um, partly, I think it's just fascinating that that itself right there is a really good illustration of self pres blind sexual dominant that right there. But I'm also interested in your experience of being a nine, which is a withdrawn type and being a sexual instinct and needing to get the attention of your crush in some kind of way. And it almost feels like that sexual energy of pursuing or it has a it has an assertive quality you know or even like the soldier story there's a sort of assertiveness that is in that story that contrasts with you being a double withdrawn trifix and so yeah. what's your like way what's your way in that situation your hand's broken your attention's on your crush what are you uh, doing i'm the stealthy silent killer you know stealthy silent killer that is that that what um i kind of have a way of maneuvering around the target i don't i don't go maybe very assertively but i go in a way that it gets unnoticed by the masses but towards the target it might be very direct and i think that's part of the sexual social game like being in a group where you kind of have all the other people where you are contrasting the uh, magnetism that you have with the one person and you are kind of maneuvering through the social thing. It's like a choreographed dance that we have. But the yeah. other ones, they are not the audience. We are the performance and the audience in it. It's kind of a form of a foreplay. And the sense of immediacy it, it has uh, as a sexual type it says that this has to be addressed now this is now life or death like i couldn't give a fuck about my hand but this is now the life or death situation because this could be the love of my life and my the rest of my life might depend on depend on this moment and my hands like body it heals itself you know <laughs> is that really where the mind goes it, like this this could be the rest of my life this could be the love of my life. is it, is it tied to love yeah. or is it well, um yeah the sexual chemistry is definitely not the same as love but mm -hmm. it has the urgency of yeah being being a life or death situation and love is something that you develop 
I guess over time and with the intimacy and safety that the sexual chemistry is something that you can kind of feel in under a second. I don't think mm-hmm. that is love. Mm-hmm. And the sexual chemistry, it can cause a lot of anxiety and going really into the spiral of all the negative feelings. And that is really not love. Yeah. One, thing, one thing also, when I have had like <laughs> really bad relationships and everything is that um, I say, I thought that the other person was the source of the chemistry. But I was really making up the whole thing. I was really the source of chemistry. And in order to get the instinctual need met, I had to ignore my self-press well-being and get my boundaries overstepped and like even to the lengths of being abused because I had to be chosen by the other one to get my instinctual needs met. So I ignored all the self-press and if it's sustainable and it's sexual social is very outwardly glamorous looking, but Mm -hmm. it's a hell like the other instincts. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. One of the things that is really like, this, it feels to me like this word boundary is really important. Actually, let me just take a second. Cause... But I, I have competency fixes. So I have read so many books about boundaries that I know by heart. Like I just studied all, like all the possible existing boundaries there could be. And now I have a coherent sense of them. So I can like apply my knowledge but still, I don't necessarily know if my boundary is being crossed. I might notice a month afterwards or a year. I don't know. Yeah, boundaries. I, let's talk about this topic for a second. Because mm-hmm. um, like you were saying, self-pres has an inherent sense of my boundedness and um, you're missing that and your instinctual stacking. And then nine is the type that has the most difficult time consciously being aware of um, where I end and the world begins. And yeah. and that's partly why I honed in on that experience of you being inside your hands. It's like, that's, you know, when an infant is discovered, the first thing that an infant does is realize that it's a separate body self. It's mm. like, I bite my thumb and it hurts, but when I bite the blanket, it doesn't hurt. And so therefore I am this distinct creature. But the nine on some level um, keeps its, ba- its like body pores open to the world. The nine is like this um, sponginess that is the world is like moving through it. It's like inside it without the possibility of there being this um, solid impermeable membrane between me and the world. And that's, it's, I think that's part of the inner work for nines is to um, establish my own boundaries so that, for example, I'm not dependent on that thing that's outside of me to rev my own engine. I can do it myself. That's, um, mm. you might say, like, one way to describe the growth trajectory of nines. And, exactly. Yeah. I guess what I'm curious about is um, what's inner work like for you? And what's it like to know yourself as a distinct entity? And um, not just to know yourself as a, a, from an intellectual point of view and talk about boundaries in this kind of cerebral way, but like to experience like, oh, this is, this is me. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, most of the stories, especially the bad ones, they are like uh, somewhat in my past where I mm-hmm. didn't have any idea about anything I had kind of uh, nuggets of knowledge that would help me. But when I got typed a year ago, it really kind of got all the puzzle pieces together with how Mm -hmm. to work myself. Um, Mm -hmm. I kind of now have a solid experience of myself. And when 
it said about God that there's this kind of immovable quality that it's not just that what it seems like outward because my inner life didn't have that I was like I didn't think that I was even existing as a solid entity at all for uh, most of uh, my life but now I have this really kind of solid uh, touch of myself and this kind of uh, it's kind of a special special feeling that I have like around myself that um, even though even though it's like double mergey it's still a two-way street you know that I can also affect my surroundings instead of it's coming all coming to me yes yeah and I I have had a lot of help with about the from the competence type uh, competency fixes with setting boundaries and like just going through so much of the material but really as a kid I was almost mute I didn't have any friends I was bullied I didn't know how how to relate to people because I don't know how common the sexual social is but according to Enneagram like it wasn't even listed because the amount is so minimal and it's a total opposite of everything else so I didn't know how to relate to people uh, I didn't see the rules that they were going by so I was alone I was mute I didn't speak to anyone I didn't have friends and wow, it's no wonder that you um, had to stab yourself in class to get yourself to <laughs> be awake I mean, it feels oh, yeah. to me like given the given the constraints of your social context and physical context, being in a very small village, um, going to class with all these people that um, were you were experiencing an active repulsion from, there were no instinctual resources for you to grab onto. No. Yeah. Uh, I was at some point so severely depressed that I spent years in bed wishing that I wasn't existing. But, wow, but like that's so far behind me because nowadays my um, baseline state is that I am feeling energetic and fascinated about life because I have kind of managed to work and make adjustments that serve me. That's what I'm doing really well. Well, that's lovely to hear. Well, for example when I work I listen to audiobooks that fascinate me mm -hmm. but it has to be stimulating enough so I have to like double up the speed oftentimes and it's mm -hmm. really counterintuitive one would think that if you are working and also adding something it would kind of cost more energy but by adding this kind of very intensive stimulating thing it doesn't take my energy at all or at least I don't feel feel like it would, because I'm experiencing the energy through the sexual instinct of self-preservation. Yeah. One thing worth mentioning is that with how the way sexual social the social is not nearly the same than uh, social types when they get the heat of just being social and doing the social thing that's not what I'm doing at all it's like social without sexual it's so tiring and I can't do it without if there's no juice mm -hmm. it's like are, we are like pretending that there's some kind of wall we are going through a conversation that uh, has been gone through every day probably or mm -hmm. <laughs> there has to be some kind of juice or kind of transformation or something that gets us deeper but mostly that is uh, a space where m most people's boundaries already crossed in a way but that's where I get my juice and sexual social friendships are they are really blurry in a way that you might you have elements of like chemistry I have kissed many of my friends and we kind of sometimes joke that we are like one polyamorous family 
because the line is a bit blurry. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I love this bullet point you wrote here. Um, dynamics and the experience of penetration, merging, self-renewal, and transformation. Those are some, yeah. those are some uh, hard-hitting words. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a sense of uh, throwing myself into something so intensely that I want to like... Uh, kind of explode and like mm -hmm. merge with the thing mm -hmm. and I want to like I want to die and be reborn again in a way you you might not always know what's on the other side but it's something better hopefully and like of course the instinct is kind of assuming that it is better in the on the other side that's part of the uh excitement that you don't know and it's like uh, doing a something that is so ecstatic that it makes you say that okay now i can die in peace you know <laughs> <laughs> and now i can die in peace yeah because um, only those yeah. are afraid of death who have never lived you know yeah <laughs> um <laughs> What I'm tuning into in this piece of the conversation is um, I love how this sort of contradicts the stereotype of nine as being afraid of um, states of my own activation oh. in the, you know, in the sense that like nine, nine is uh, conceived as um, managing energy to stay or like to, su to suppress myself in a sense beneath a certain level of vitality. Um, if I get, if I get over activated as a nine, it feels threatening. Um, mm. but it depend here, about, yeah, yeah, please continue. And so here you are saying if something gets inside you in enough that like, you know, your fascination is lit up and you uh, are on the verge of a kind of, um, like whole system orgasm, <laughs> you know, the, the yeah. ecstasy, the ecstasy of, um, what i'm of being penetrated by this uh, object of fascination or sexual experience or something like that that feels yeah um it's hard it's... to put into words but uh, something that i'm so immersed by the thing and i'm so thoroughly penetrating the thing mm -hmm. or the person that there is no other way but to transform into something new and i think part of the transformation uh, aspect is that in an of course evolutionarily when you have sex you get pregnant you will have a baby and stuff that's when everything is changing so automatically when you are attracting sexual partners you kind of need to have the readiness for uh, change that everything gets all new and transforms. I, maybe I don't know. Okay, that's an interesting way to put it. Can but you? I don't, yep. Do you have a sense of um, like the essential quality of nine is? Um, I like these. I like the word harmony. Yeah. And there's a way that nines are seeking a state of harmony. Through, yeah, well, my, my harmony yeah. is different. My yeah, harmony yeah, yeah. is found uh, when there's a sense of danger or a desire, and I will go there and I will go walk on the blade edge, see if I can balance right in there. Because how else would you experience the balance the most intensely? I love it. I love this. And what is it? Um... This is where language becomes blunt and problematic because it's just not adequate to explain this. But I feel like words like feeling harmonious and walking on the blade's edge seem, at least at a verbal level, to be in contrast. But in your yeah. inner experience, there's a kind of, there's a way that when you're in that state, um, it is actually 
the place of inner harmony that you want to be. Mm, yeah. I really don't like the stereotype about nines that they would be really like passive or uh-huh. weepy or doormats because yeah. when it said the nine is a peacemaker, if there is an imbalance somewhere, nine can just go and make the peace happen because it kind of has this gut uh, quality of I'm going to like make that happen in that in the space you know mm-hmm. i think yeah. that's true nines. yes how conscious is that for you or how how much are you aware of actually asserting my experience of nines and in the way you're describing is like their presence emanates um uh an oceanic quality of settled body yeah. energy and or settling and and it's like they're they're doing something <laughs> that is or yeah. maybe they're not or maybe they're not doing something that is itself the thing that settles their um environment or whatever and there's a maybe a way you're saying that nines can consciously apply that superpower yeah yeah maybe attachment also in the body it could be a two-way street as well maybe (laughs) i don't know Hmm. but in my case i have well competency types come with um unfounded confidence as as well as uh centrist blind and i have uh, the eight wing so there are like three factors that would allow me to be assertive and be like uh, maybe overimposing myself. Sure. Yeah. Also, I just realized that what I said about the settling thing is really flavored by my social lens. Like that's my mm-hmm. experience of how nines settle a room. Yeah. And, okay. and I wonder if you would put different language to it in terms of nine, the settling energy and the sexual instinct. have a really hard time seeing seeing like how it would go with the sexual you know it's i'll just, i'll okay. give a stab at this yeah good or yeah. you want it uh, please go ahead <laughs> like the word settle it feels inadequate it doesn't feel quite on it like mm-hmm. my experience of your energy and sexual nineness is that it's not well there is a settling but it's more of like a it's it has a quality of like why don't you come over here and rest with me on this pillow? <laughs> it's, you know, or why don't we both be pillows together? You know, it's, yeah. it's like, come, come melt with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This kind of conf- conf- comforting, disarming, this kind of, yeah. Yeah. It. It's like together we'll just dissolve into um, liquid together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we don't need the yeah. head type thing yeah. that will pop all the balloons, <laughs> you know. That's that's maybe the harmony, I think. That's 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 a way to I feel like I'm trying to um mm. unint- I'm not doing this intentionally, but I feel like I'm trying to box this experience that you have into the language I already have, which is like nine and harmony and settling and stuff like that. But it feels like just to do the exercise for a second, it's like the way that nine as ex- sexual nine is approaching or experiencing or trying to get after harmony is that sense of like, come dissolve with me. Mm. Yeah. 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 I think the ultimate point of harmony would be this kind of ultimate merging point. Yes. Th- yes. Yes. Because there you go. Yeah. Especially with self press blind, it's a roller coaster because you are either kind of lighting up the fire or doing the seducing ritual or you don't but I don't have this table thing that usually when you are in a relationship you kind of get into this table phase that you don't have to do anything and you don't know it's there and it's kind of built and maintained I think but because I didn't have an innate experience of that 
that felt like it's going in a down, downward uh, spiral. It was going downwards in a way. Right. Even though it was neutral. So that always was really kind of alarming to me. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at the rest of your bullet points here, and I'm wondering if there's anything else that you want to touch on or yeah. feels right to start closing. Where are you at? Oh, I think I have a thing about ex sex blind, like sexual blind. Sure. Mm. Well, what they do in the... Like, we are, as sexual types, we are doing the seduction and attraction choreography again and again and again. And I think like sexual blinds, like, okay, we can do it this once and then we don't have to do it again. But for me, it's like, are you going to gym for once and then you expect to be fit for your whole life? Like, it doesn't work like that. But I think that's what uh, sexual blinds are often doing. And for some reason, they don't... Like this, of course, doesn't apply to all, but I have noticed this in my own relationships that once you have done it with a person, you they don't like want to do it again with the same person. They they are going to look for it out somewhere outside the relationship. They are compartmentalizing the sexual in a way that is not impacting their daily life. It's in its own tiny box. Yeah. It's for me, it's such a like foundational. Like, it's the main experience of all of my living moments. If I'm really into someone that I don't, I can't experience really. There's nothing else in my mind. So it's weird that it just brings brings me so much loneliness to see that. Uh, the other person is not impacted by me. I think the loneliest I have felt is in, in my relationships. And often sexual blinds have this kind of uh, thing that women can be through two things. You are I either this uh, wife material role or a piece of meat. Meaning that you can be either the social role or the self press piece of meat, but <laughs> many wouldn't fuck the same person they would marry. Like, what's what's up with that? That that's like major uh -huh. compartmentalizing. <laughs> and for me, that's the my sexuality is the primary way to. Um, exist as a person so it just gets a lot of people angry <laughs> when i'm not uh, when i'm not molded into one of their very narrow molds and it also hurts me a lot because um, in relationships they either expect me to be one or the other and i don't want to and i want to renew the Flame. I want to renew the seduction, but usually they kind of don't. So that's where I feel the most lonely. Yeah. But now when I'm alone, I'm not so lonely because I enjoy my company. So I guess it's better to be alone because if I'm uh, starting to starting of dehydration and the only available drink is poison. Would I drink it? I don't know. Now, now I'm not drinking it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm just kind of pausing and taking in what you're saying because I think it's really profound. Okay. Um, what's your advice for sexual blind people? There's a lot of them out there. Mm. Uh, 
trying to find ways to be attracted by the person itself, not as a role or not, not as a consumable piece of meat, but as a person. Doesn't mean in a sexual context. You can just like sit down and look at each other, maybe uh, not even talk. What I do with a, I have a friend who is a sexual nine. We often play chess together. It's like this kind of mind mind game, like who is penetrating and who is being like subdued and everything. It requires no talking. But there's still this kind of playful taking turns. And it's like ping ponging but with sexual chemistry. And like how does it how does it feel in the body? How do you notice you are attracted? When they are doing something well, are you attracted to them and just like really sitting with it with the feeling taking time with it like for example women it might take even half an hour an hour that the body is catching up and starting to activate the erotic area so uh, slowly wow that chess example is really amazing yeah because like, yeah. remembering that people are they are souls in the body. They are souls that are souls are magnificent. Souls are the things that are. Well, I don't want to get too religious, but like the image of God, you know, mm-hmm. and that is something to admire and something to worship. Something that you would give your life for something to uh that you appreciate and respect and you kind of enter this uh celebration of joining your souls you know mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> i like that it's beautiful yeah um i love this this thing about chess because it takes something that most people approach or conceive of as a very dry cerebral exercise and it moves it in the direction of a highly textured and rich um, experience of sexual tension. Mm. And the slowness of one person takes a turn and there's some impact and another person takes a turn and there's some impact and sensing into that at a body level where two human beings and souls are connected as opposed to just people's hands moving pieces on a board. That is really fascinating to me. You could even take yeah. that as a whole metaphor for what a relationship is. Um, yeah. Experienced as sexual blind versus sexual dominant. Mm. Yeah, with the other sexual nine, we just like, we are just throwing and catching ball often or mm-hmm. playing this kind of ball game. So what, whatever, like board games and that kind of stuff. We are not necessarily talking. I think he's also head last. But we have this kind of very playful, uh, flip and polarizing energy. And um, what else? It's funny. Also, kind of, yeah, one thing that to also think about that where are we similar? Uh, where are we kind of similar that we could be made from the same uh, origin or but and where are the points that we are polarizing where are, where are we so opposite that there is kind of friction that creates energy where we can like what we can use to uh, create this kind of tension and uh, magnetic force of, of opposites attracting yeah. Um, I'm thinking maybe we'll come to a close soon. And I'm curious, how are you feeling now? And yeah, where you're at? 
<laughs> well, uh, I'm very happy. I had no idea that the time's already gone by because I had actually still stuff that I would have wanted to tell, but oh. uh, it's fine because there's still a lot of stuff, you know. But um, I feel happy. I feel relaxed and relieved that when I had so many things I wanted to share and I finally got to share them. And I was so excited about this. And the way I kind of... uh, My mindset about challenges is the (laughs) display thing that, oh, now I finally get to uh, enjoy the thing that I'm good about and kind of go and do my display and kind of celebrate the things that I enjoy and let the others also see the celebration and I don't know it's but this has been it's been so interesting going through my things I don't I'm not sure if it made any coherent sense. Hopefully it did. <laughs> I think it did. I think it'll be interesting for you to watch it back and uh, see what okay. what comes up from you after that. Okay. How are you feeling? I feel I feel great. Yeah, it's really enjoying. I'm really enjoying talking to you, and um, I feel like. You know, my sense is that you were saying to me before the call that my heart has a kind of expansive way it fills the room and you were kind of vibing in that. And my experience Mm -hmm. of you is very similar, actually, although it's at this body level. So it's kind of, um, yeah, it's lovely to kind of swim in this um, cauldron here with you. Thanks. It was a very inviting space. (laughs) Well, thanks for doing this. Well, you're welcome. And thank you a lot for this opportunity. Yeah, you're welcome.